Today, one of the most concerning diseases in the developed world is cancer. This is a disease that is the number one killer in the developed country. Any person who hears the statement, you have cancer, is immediately very concerned about their survival. Now, over the last several decades, there has been a, an approach or thinking about cancer, which is, if we use the example of a Ferrari, um, to blow up the car. Now, if we use the example of a Ferrari and the treatment of cancer, it, it's the Ferrari on the road that is ca causing the death of patients, not the Ferrari that's parked in the garage. And it is the spread of cancer that ultimately kills people rather than usually the, the primary disease. And it is unusual, in fact, for the, for the primary disease to, to cause the death of our patients. Now, if we use the example of diabetes, diabetes mellitus, this is a disease which is caused by a disease within the pancreas, insulin secreting cells, and this leads to a production of high levels of glucose in the blood. With appropriate treatment, the insulin levels can be restored in humans and people can live with the disease of diabetes, ultimately dying from some of the complications. In the case of cancer, it is these complications of cancer that kill patients, and in particular the spread of the disease. So our thinking has been to, to change completely the paradigm of cancer and think not so much about the car and blowing up the car, killing the primary cancer, but rather understanding how it is that the cancer spreads and having defined the mechanisms of spread to design new types of treatment that will block the spread of cancer. Now, ultimately, it, it, we now know that cancer has a GPS, uh, a, a global positioning system, which sends the cancer to distant sites, to the brain, to the bones, to the kidneys and, and adrenals and other types of organs in the body and the liver. And this, this spread of the disease which kills patients involves a well-preserved GPS system. So our approach has been to confuse the GPS, to turn off the GPS, uh, having identified that, that particular apparatus. Now the, the discovery of the, of the GPS in cancer was quite serendipitous. Uh, our research asked a very fundamental question. If we look at the genes that are turned on in the primary cancer and we look at the genes that are turned on in the metastatic cancer, what, what are the genes that turn on when a normal cell starts to become migratory, starts to drive on the road? And we demonstrated that in breast epithelial cells, the transformation process involves the upregulation of a receptor on the surface of the cancer cell. And that receptor is known as CCR5. The CCR5 is sufficient to uh, guide the cancer cells to the bones, uh, to the lungs and to other tissues. In the case of prostate cancer, we showed that if we take a normal prostate epithelial cell and we transform it with an oncogene, an oncogene called SARC or RAS or MYC or ERB2, any one of these oncogenes is sufficient to turn on the abundance, basically produce GPS on the surface of the prostate epithelial cell. Well, the importance of this is that, that the CCR5, the GPS in these breast epithelial cells or in the prostate epithelial cells and in fact many other cancers, there are drugs that have been designed in the past to block this receptor. This receptor also serves as a entry port for the HIV receptor. So the HIV virus, which is important in the production of AIDS and subsequently the death of patients with AIDS, that same receptor is the GPS for cancer. So we took some of those drugs that have been used in patients with HIV, used to block the entry of the HIV virus, and we showed that the same doses, the same doses of 
drug that were sufficient to block entry of the HIV virus were sufficient to block the spread of the breast cancer or of the prostate cancer in preclinical models. The data was so compelling that in the case of mice where prostate cancer had spread to the brain and the bones of the mice and ultimately killed the mice, using this CCR5 inhibitor, the HIV receptor entry blocking drug, was sufficient to completely block the spread to the brain and the bone of these uh, animals in preclinical studies. Well, the importance of this is uh, twofold. It provides an opportunity for us to create new types of clinical trials and hopefully treatment, and to do so in a way in which we avoid a lot of the side effects of current treatments for cancer. Rather than, as I said, blowing up the car, we're able to simply turn off the GPS so that it doesn't spread to the bones and brain. Because these drugs have been FDA approved, approved by the federal government for humans in the treatment of HIV, this represents an opportunity for us to retask these drugs, having con once conducted clinical studies in patients with cancer, in order to deploy these types of treatments for patients in the future. This offers tremendous hope for so many patients where currently we have very little to offer in the case of patients with metastatic cancer. So again, I think taking an agnostic position to the potential mechanisms driving cancer, simply looking at the data in an empirical way and uh, testing these hypotheses leads hopefully ultimately to a disease that we can live with rather than die of. Importantly, this allows us to conduct intelligent approaches to the treatment of cancer. If we can see the CCR5 in the patient's tumour, then we can target that patient's tumour with a CCR5 blocking drug. Hopefully the repurposing of this drug will be supported by government agencies to provide alternative treatments where we currently have very little available. Let me share with you some of the experiments that we conducted to understand better the role of this CCR5 receptor in human cancer. The first types of questions we addressed were, is this receptor overexpressed in, in human cancer? And so we, we looked in human breast cancer and we looked at 2,200 patients. And we found that in one particular group of patients, luminal B breast cancer subtype, nearly every patient had overexpressed this CCR5, this receptor that's used by the HIV virus to, to enter the cell. So this suggested to us that potentially this was a target of importance in the management of clinical disease. More recently, we looked at patients with prostate cancer and again found that there's a very significant number of patients with prostate cancer that have the CCR5 in the prostate cancer itself. In the subsequent studies, we asked very straightforward questions. We didn't know that CCR5 was sufficient to promote invasion of breast or prostate cells. So we turned on the CCR5 in human breast cancer and in human prostate cancer, and we simply asked the question, if we turn on CCR5, what happens to those epithelial cells? What we found was quite, quite exciting. Turning on CCR5 in human breast cancer cells promoted the ability of these breast cancer cells to invade into the local environment. And furthermore, it promoted the spread of breast cancer into the bloodstream and the spread to the lungs of, of animals. This was a very dramatic effect, but the question was, could we interfere with the spread of these cancers to the lungs in breast cancer? So we took two types of drugs previously approved by the FDA in the US for use in, uh, in HIV. And these, um, these FDA approved inhibitors of CCR5 were used at the same dose 
that are used in humans. So in the preclinical studies, the use of CCR5 inhibitors was sufficient to block the spread of these breast cancer cells to the lungs. This was a very dramatic effect with a dramatic reduction in the number of breast cancer cells that spread to the lungs of the animals. Similarly, in the case of prostate cancer, we took normal prostate epithelial cells and transformed them with an oncogene. The oncogenes that are important in prostate cancer in humans are the SARC oncogene. In fact, in humans with prostate cancer, about 80 to 85% of patients have activation of SARC kinase in their prostate cancer. So we overexpressed SARC kinase activity in normal prostate epithelial cells, and that was sufficient to induce malignancy, malignant prostate cancer cells. And these malignant prostate cancer cells invaded locally, entered the bloodstream, and uh, spread to the bones and brains of mice, ultimately killing these animals. So given that the CCR5 was expressed on the prostate epithelial cells when they became cancerous, we asked the question, if we block the activity of CCR5, will it block that invasive activity? The experiments were really quite dramatic. In animals that were treated with the drugs that block CCR5, the same drugs that had been used to block the HIV virus entry via the CCR5, these compounds dramatically reduced the spread of prostate cancer cells to the brain and to the bones. And ultimately, it's uh, very frequently the spread of the disease that kills patients. In the case of the mice, the treatment with these inhibitors dramatically reduced the spread of the cancer to the brains and to the bones. <music>